everyone and welcome to the retro channel and yes i've been busy redesigning the place a little bit just tidying up and getting organized and also redoing the display behind me which is why i haven't made a video in the last couple of weeks but we're back on track now and um yeah things are a lot more organized and easily accessible thankfully so um let's get back into it with the commodore 128 dcr this is the one that I had issues with the power supply on and uh, I pretty much bit the bullet and I'm going to replace it with a Meanwell power supply. Now I did go through and test this thing, uh, swapped out a whole bunch of components and to be honest it just would not work. Uh, I still had massive ripple on the 5 volt rail and that was causing the interference in the video and audio signal that we saw in the last episode. So um, yeah, I've pretty much given up trying to get this thing working properly and we're just gonna throw the mean well in. It's just much more reliable and I know that it's gonna last a long time. So mean well it is. Um, this thing, obviously it, you know, it's still complete. So um, I guess, the, uh, the owner of the machine can hold on to that if they want. I mean, this isn't my machine. Mine's actually up there. So um, yeah, the owner of this can do whatever he wants with the original power supply, but I'm doing this in a way where we don't have to make uh, any modifications to the outer case. So everything is completely reversible um, just in case. I mean, these machines are becoming more rare by the day, so we don't want to destroy it in any uh, obvious way at least. So um, let's open this up and take a look inside and we'll see what I've been up to. All right, so we'll whip off the cover. And as you can see, I've already put in an AC transformer uh, for the AC supply. Um, it's not really that necessary, especially with the 128 DCR. It really just handles the time of day clocks, which are on the CIA chips. And beyond that, uh, the supply for the tape port. That is practically all the AC side does in the DCR. Um, so, I mean, it's there just in case. Yep, I mean, I want to do this properly. And you'll also notice that I've put some little standoffs here. These are where our Meanwell supply is going to fit. And it should sit nicely right about there. No, that's backwards. It would be this way. So I've wired the main supply into a little connector and crimped on some plugs there and same with the other side so that'll just plug in there like so and I've also put an inline fuse for the AC side um, just because without that we won't there isn't a fuse on the actual board of the 128 DCR so um, like the original power supply which has an AC side fuse uh, I've just sort of replicated that here uh, apart from that, obviously the Meanwell has got a mains fuse along with a bunch of other protections like over voltage and over current protection. So uh, much more reliable. I can't speak for the quality of this one, but I'm pretty sure it's fairly cheaply made and probably quite rubbish. So hopefully this should supply a nice clean uh, 5 and 12 volt rail. Not that the 12 volt rail really matters that much because it's only supplying the disk drive um, just for the motors, but the 5 volt rail is very important to have a nice clean supply with minimal ripple. So that should be what we'll get from this supply. Oh, one more thing. You'll probably notice that the LED cable, uh, which used to connect to this supply over here, um, obviously is just floating around. Now, I shouldn't have connected those, but I should be able to flip this over. What I've actually done with this Meanwell power supply is put in a resistor from this point here, which is the 12 volt rail, over to this pin here, which is this empty hole here. On this particular power supply, it looks like it also functions as, I think, 
by the silkscreen, a PT65, which must have a negative rail uh, available as well. But on this particular one, all those components are just unpopulated. So it was handy because I can actually use that final pin and because there's nothing connecting it to the other rails, uh, I've just put in a little plug here, which uh, was also already marked on the board. And the other side of that is already connected to ground. So we'll have our 12 volt supply on, I think this outer pin, and then the inner pin is our ground connection for the LED. So that sort of worked out perfectly. And the little resistor, I think it's a 3.3K or maybe a 330 ohm. I just pretty much copied whatever they used on the original supply, which uh, looks to be this one here. So I think that's 3.3, yeah, I think it's 3.3K. So um, yeah, that kind of worked out quite well. That should be a fully functioning power supply and we should have our LED working and uh, it's also quite safe. And I've only had to make a couple of small holes in this metal plate in order to make it work. So as I said, completely reversible uh, apart from the holes, but it's not really part of the outer case. So who cares? Um, let's fire it up and see what happens. Before I do that, we'll just test the earth connection because this is a metal case and at least in Australia, if you've got exposed metal, uh, you need to be able to have everything earthed. So this Meanwell power supply, it actually has an earth terminal here, but because our earth is actually going to this metal part here, um, that pretty much comes back up through these screws. So fully safe there and the outer case of this transformer is also earth so we are all good to go there safety first let's leave the top off we'll just turn it on without connecting anything just to see what happens i need an iec connector Here we go. Power on. Well, disk drive spun up. Do we have the power LED? Cause I can't see that from here. No, we don't. I might've just got that around the wrong way. There's not much length there. Okay, we do now have the power LED and everything seems to work and it's not making that horrible whiny sound that this piece of crap made. So awesome, let's hook up a display, see how it looks. Right, so I've got it hooked up to the good old Commodore 1084S monitor. Um, Power that on and I didn't think this through. Power on the computer and there we go. It uh, yeah, it looks pretty good. I mean, it's still got some faint jail bars through the image, but that's really just inherent of the Commodore 128 because of how the VIC-2E uh, was constructed. A lot of those data and signaling signals end up getting um, mixed in with the video and you just get jail bars. Um, there is a little way around it if you use, uh, I think Copper Dragon also has a mod similar to the one for the Commodore 64 where it generates uh, component video by predicting what, sig what the VIC is about to do, but um, that's a story for another day. Uh, the main thing is it works and it doesn't look like shit 
and it's not making any horrible noise, although I haven't actually checked if the volume's turned up. There's a buzzing, but that's just the monitor itself, I would imagine. And that door's broken. Anyway, let's do a couple of diagnostic tests just to make sure this thing is actually functioning correctly. Uh, and I guess the first one is just the simple Commodore 64 diagnostics. May as well start off with them and go from there. If I know where I put them. Yes, I'm so organized. Where is everything? Pretty sure they're in here. In fact, I may have actually put the 128 uh, diagnostic tests on this cartridge. i just got to plug this in and find out. All right, let's see. Yes, uh, so this is the Commodore 128 40 column diagnostic. Uh, I think I found this on World of Yanni or, or Janny. I, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that person's name, but um, yeah, I think this is one that's modified to work uh, also as the function ROM. Um, so you can also stick it in, I think it's U38 in the Commodore 128 boards and you can forever run diagnostics if you wanted to. I think there is a key, like something on the keyboard that can disable it from booting from the function ROM. I don't remember. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty sure this one takes quite a while to test these RAM banks. So um, we'll fast forward a little bit. Yeah, okay. It takes quite some time. Um, there is another diagnostic for the 128, uh, but I think you need a cartridge that'll actually work uh, in 128 mode. So it's not the same as a Commodore 64 cartridge. Uh, I think the the game and the XROM lines are either set high or low or something. Um, and I, I actually couldn't find like even just a PCB to make a Commodore 128 cartridge. So maybe that's something I'll look into unless somebody knows of one uh, that'll actually run in 128 mode rather than just um, jumping straight into Commodore 64 mode, which is what pretty much every cartridge will do when you plug it in to a 128. Um, but yeah, I think that diagnostic also does tests on the 1571 disk drive. So that would be quite handy to have going. Now, after the RAM tests are done, we can finally see that there's a bunch of bad ports, but that's just because I don't have the harness hooked up. And I'm not sure if you heard the start of that test, but where it normally plays that little different tones, uh, it actually just made a popping noise. Now I knew that the SID was bad um, in this machine in the last episode, but I didn't include it in that episode because it already was lengthy enough. So yes, this machine does unfortunately have a dead SID. Uh, the DCR uses the 8580 SID. And I believe when I spoke to the owner, he said he had a spare one around, so I'm not gonna go replacing that, but yeah, the SID is unfortunately bad in this machine. Everything else on the other hand seems to work. Now, I'm not gonna hook up the diagnostic cartridge because the one that I have uh, actually doesn't fit the DCR because the motherboard layout is different. Um, the cassette port, which is normally on the back, uh, is actually around over here next to the keyboard connector and I simply didn't make the cable long enough to actually reach around to the cassette port. So I'm not even going to worry about that. I'd say the system functions as it should. In fact, there's a tape drive just there. Ew. A fairly crappy looking tape drive, but... 
excuse me. Let's just, it looks safe to connect. Let's just plug that in and we'll just see, oh my God, the cable on this is like a rock. Yeah. We'll just see if the actual tape drive works. Um, that would be an indication that our AC supply also works. And I might actually need to unplug the cartridge first, perhaps. Yeah, tape drive appears to work. So the AC side, which is what we put the transformer in there is working. And we also saw the time of day clocks on the diagnostic test were working. So everything is looking good. Um, like I said, I'm not going to worry too much about all the ports. They should all work fine. My main concern is actually testing the disk drive. Um, cause yeah, nobody really wants to use a cassette, but a disk drive, it's kind of handy to still have, even though there are alternatives out there for, um, loading disk images. Uh, let's see what we've got. Uh, 1541 test disc. That would be the first thing to do. I'm pretty sure I've got um, World of Yanni's uh, 1541 diagnostic on the Easy Flash here. So that in. So yeah, this is pretty much when you put that uh, cartridge that's made for the Commodore 64, it'll boot straight into Commodore 64 mode uh, and pretty much bypass 128 mode. Uh, so this is it, I believe. So this won't test the full functionality of the 1571 disk drive, but at least it'll give us an idea if it works for 1541 um, and Commodore GCR formatted disks. So let's do an alignment check first. That's not a good sound. Oh no. Maybe the um, the read head was just going back to track zero. I thought these had a way to detect um, like a track zero detection, but maybe not. But uh, so far things are looking good. So on track readers all reading at 100%. The between track read, you can pretty much ignore this. Um, yeah, it doesn't really matter. And the only time you're gonna get all zeros is if you've got a disc that was formatted on that same drive. And even then you probably won't get everything at a zero. This one looks pretty close actually, which is surprising. That's probably the, the best aligned drive that I've had. But yeah, like I said, as long as the on track read is a hundred, um, you don't really need to worry. <laughs> the last one's minus 87. That looks perfectly fine. Uh, let's go back and I think I'll need a blank disc for this. I assume this doesn't have anything on it. We're just gonna check the speed. Now the speed on this should also read just fine because I'm pretty sure it has a way to detect uh, what speed the drive runs at and it automatically adjusts it. So it's always pretty much spot on 300 RPM. I don't even think there's a way to change the speed manually, even if you wanted to. So speed looks good. I'm just gonna do a quick performance test as well, just to make sure everything else appears to be working. This will take a couple of minutes. Uh, we can put that back. I don't think I need anything else from here. Let's 
It's doing the slow format, so yeah, that will take a couple of minutes. I can hear the, the read right head slowly bumping its way across the disc. A lot of things just do a quick format and you can tell the difference because the read right head pretty much, you can hear it going tick, 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 whereas this one's just tick, tick. So that's gonna take a minute. So yeah, uh, yeah, 128 cartridge. Um, I think again, World of Yanni, I've been frequenting that site recently. Um, I think it does uh, have a little circuit diagram of what a 128 cartridge um, should look like and how it should be wired, but I actually couldn't find anyone who's actually made a PCB to put one together. So and I'm shit at making PCBs. I wouldn't know where to start, but I guess that's probably a simple one. So maybe I should learn from that. <sighs> Yeah, this is going to take a few minutes. Oh, we didn't test 80 column mode. I should do that as well. Just to make sure the um, 80 column stuff is working. Yeah. I think we're going to have a pass. Yay. No, I do not want to do that again. Uh, let's check 80 column. Uh, I think I've got just under the bench here. Oops. Oh, let go. Alright, so for the 80 column, blah, blah, blah. for the 80 column display, we need a just a DE9 uh, straight through male to male. Uh, at least for this monitor anyway, it's like the Commodore um, 80 column display mode is pretty much the same, like at least very similar to um, CGA. So pretty much the same connectors, although some of the Commodore monitors actually use a DIN connector um, for their RGBI input. So I do have a little cable that takes a DE9 and changes it to an eight pin DIN for those monitors. Uh, but this one has a DE9 connector. So let's turn on 80 column display on the keyboard and I guess I'll have to switch that on the monitor. Hopefully I've got that right. Nope. Uh, TTL, here we go. Nope. What have I done wrong here? Ah, I've still got the easy flash plugged in, so it's going to ignore the 4080 column display when that's connected. Huh. And yeah, this is what, oh, it's actually overlaying it while trying to, <laughs> um, on this, um, this is actually the monitor doing that. It's not the Commodore 128. The monitor is trying to overlay both signals on the same screen. But normally if we ignore that, that's what the Commodore 128 would look like if you've got it set to 80 column but displaying it by, you know, composite or, or separate video. So that is what we should see for the normal 80 column mode. And yep, it looks sharp. It obviously works. Uh, I don't actually have anything that I can really use to take advantage of this mode. Um, yeah, it's pretty much CPM mode and requires MFM formatted discs and, um, and yeah so um that's good it works that's really all I wanted to know um, let's switch back out of that mode huh 
you can see it still sort of came through a little bit there when I first powered it on. All right, back to 128 mode. One more thing I want to check is the actual function of both the drive heads because these drives have a top and a bottom read right head, whereas a 1541 does not. And that other test program would have only tested the bottom head. So we're going to fire up another program just to make sure the disk drive is completely working because sometimes the top head could die or there could be something wrong with it and you wouldn't know if you were just running uh, 1541 disks. So I'm going to use the Pi Drive Zero so that I can load up a bit of software without having to rely on the disk drive and we'll test out the full functionality of this disk drive. Uh, test programs. One of these, I think it's the C128 factory test version 1.2. I think I got this off a different website, so I'll put a link in the description. Um, but that should be the right one. And hopefully I've got the Pi drive set up as device nine. Yes, that's looking good. Yes, cool. Um, so we want to make sure our device numbers are correct. So our load device number, we want to load from device nine. Run tests on device eight. System type to be tested. What are the other options? C128D 1571. So I guess it, it can either test just a 1571 standalone if you have a normal C128 or you can test a C128D which obviously has the 1571 built in. So let's go with 128D. Um, oh yeah, and this monitor is not great. It sort of bows in at the top. It's got, it's got issues, unfortunately. Um, Let's load this up. I'm just going to go through these, see if there's anything interesting. I thought it was just a disk drive tester, but maybe it does some other stuff. I don't know if it's designed to test a 128 DCR because I'm pretty sure some of the ROM versions are different. So I might end up with errors on these tests. So I guess it's one way to find out. Right, so all these tests went on a bit longer than I expected, um, so I just cut that part out. But I'm pretty satisfied that the disk drive in this machine works perfectly. Uh, it does want me to also take this disk that it's written and test it in another 1571. Uh, I could do that, but I'm not going to bother. Uh, it did do a bunch of read and write tests on both sides of the disk. Blah, blah, blah on both sides of the disk, both in MFM and GCR formats. So I'm pretty satisfied that it's working 100%. And on that note, that pretty much wraps up the work on this particular machine. Now I am going to use it for a little bit longer because I do want to compare it to the Commodore 128D and also the standard Commodore 128 because there are quite a few differences between these three models. So that's going to be coming up in the near future. But until then, uh, big thanks to everyone for watching. Uh, massive thanks to the people that subscribe and like the videos. And of course, leave me comments if you've got any questions or suggestions, whatever. And a huge thanks to the people that support me on Patreon. And if you want to support the channel, you can find links to that down below. You can also support on YouTube. But yeah, until next time, thanks for watching the Retro Channel. Bye.
that's weird. All those tests sounded exactly as they should. So maybe there's nothing wrong with the SID after all. Maybe it's just that particular diagnostic test. All right, so I'm just gonna run the Commodore 64 dead test. Um, this is the slightly modified version uh, by, uh, I think it's Stefan, maybe. I'll put a link to this in the description as well, but it does have a more advanced uh, SID test at the end. So I wanna see if it sounds normal on this or not. Well, there was part of it missing. I think the third voice had a bit of missing information, but I'm gonna let it run through again and just see if it changes. Maybe it's just some weird incompatibility with the um, Commodore 64 dead test and diagnostic ROMs. I, it's very bizarre. time it sounded normal. Um, I don't know, maybe the SID is on the way out and it just works when it wants to. Um, like I said, the owner of this machine has a spare SID, so um, I guess it's not a huge deal, but um, yeah, that was a little bit more video that I didn't plan on filming. So um, yeah, once again, thanks for watching. Bye.